Uh, let me get going. Uh, Natalie Goodman speaking, founder, CEO of Incentifind, uh, and my background's architecture. And in a quick nutshell, I have specialized um, mostly in embedding sustainable measures on very complex assets, uh, laboratories uh, within the oil and gas industry, pharmaceuticals, uh, as well as uh, Department of Defense. And the whole reason behind embedding sustainable measures in these complex assets, as you can imagine, was um, to increase the value of the assets uh, for the corporation, but also as part of achieving um, corporate sustainability goals, and uh, as well as creating healthy buildings, which we all know is really important, especially post COVID, right? Uh, so about Incentifind, um, we are still stand as the nation's only database for real estate incentives that can connect any property in the United States and Canada to incentives using a two minute survey. And you're gonna see this uh, towards the end of today's presentation, how easy it is to fill out a two minute survey about any property, whether it's existing or prospective, um, a new construction, for example, or ground up, but you fill out a two minute survey, uh, purchase what we call a verify report. It verifies your eligibility, your property's eligibility, and we'll show you all the incentives you can go after further. We'll stay there with you and ensure you capture the incentives. In other words, we are full turnkey incentive services, right? You can search, verify your eligibility, and we can even apply to the incentives. So uh, we're here to really, more than anything, flush cost savings and reward things like achieving ESG goals, right? Um, so that said, I want to hand the floor over to Eric with AutoCase. He's going to tell you uh, a little bit about the, our partnership, his company. Um, he's going to go into AutoCase, address ESGs, everything that's changing in the landscape, um, you know, with ESG, ESG reporting. Um, and then after that, Eric, we'll look forward to your demonstration. So without further ado, please, floor is yours. Hey, thanks, Natalie. Appreciate that. Well, uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for, for joining today. Um, just finished a, a webinar with the uh, American General Contractors Association as well, speaking about some, some similar considerations, more so on the, the construction side as well. So it's great, great to be here and uh, definitely a lot to talk about today. I think uh, things are quite dynamic as we think about regulations, policies, uh, disclosure mandates and, and how to assess and evaluate um, implanting some of those considerations in, into your project. So my, my name is Eric. I'm the chief economist at uh, AutoCase and um, I get to do, do lots of things on a daily basis, but um, really at our, our heart, AutoCase is a, a software as a service firm and it's our goal essentially to create a, a TurboTax version of complex economic analysis in the built environment, supporting architects, engineers, uh, sustainability consultants, and, and building owners. I get to lead a, a team of economists. We get to collaborate with uh, a team of software engineers. You can imagine our Christmas parties are, are probably quite dry, um, but nonetheless, it's um, a stimulating work environment and we get to support um, building owners and, and really cool projects on, on a daily basis. Maybe we can head to the next slide. Uh, so we, we support um, many different entities. Um, maybe if we can think of the sectors that we support would be uh, the AEC side, architecture, engineering, consultancy. So we work with architects, uh, engineers, sustainability consultants, um, experts in the space that provide guidance to uh, building owners. And we work with building owners as well. Um, we also work with building owners on the public side. Uh, Natalie mentioned uh, work with uh, the, the DOD and the federal government. We do quite a bit of work as well on that end, uh, municipal, state, and local as well. So think of um, you know the, the top 10 of 20 ENR engineering news record architecture firms as our clients. So we work with um, quite a broad array from um, small, mid-sized to, to the large ones and support all sectors from mixed use, um, commercial, industrial, uh, aviation, and, and everywhere in between. We've got three dozen typologies within our software that, that we support. Um, we are um, minority owned by Autodesk, the giant software design firm as well, and our 
you know, very much interested in, in continuing our, our collaboration within the design suite. And um, you know, it's just um, great to, to support this group on, on a daily basis as well. Maybe we can jump to the next slide. Um, so I think just to distill what, what we do within the, the software product uh, is really uh, to build that complex business case very quickly, precisely, objectively, and defensively um, towards outcomes from greater investments in sustainability, resilience, and um, health outcomes. And so the idea is that uh, we're a cloud-based sustainability ESG business case tool. Um, and the idea is that we, we work with designers, we work with owners, and identify how different designs, different elements within a project um, drive sustainability, drive outcomes, impact costs, um, not just from the upfront standpoint, but life cycle perspective, and how that can implicate and drive benefits throughout the life of the project. Um, and so the idea is to speak to these environmental social governance, ESG, also known as, as triple bottom line, financial, social, and environmental impacts to all stakeholders within a project, owners, um, building occupants, and the host community in which these projects are, are developed as well. Next slide. So we talk to a lot of clients um, on a daily basis. We operate across North America and um, we can only develop a great product if we speak to our clients and we understand what, what their challenges are. And so I've been in the real estate and infrastructure world for about 15 years, um, first with a, a large integrated AEC firm, now uh, supporting the entire industry as an independent firm. And what, what we hear it really has shifted over, over the, the last decade or so. And we're going from some you know, key conversation points around sustainability from, let's say, what is it cost? Uh, looking only in many cases at upfront capital costs. What does it cost to embed sustainability to, well, what is it worth? What's that value perspective? Looking not just at those upfront costs, but throughout the life cycle of the project and the trade-offs between the benefits that they provide. Um, you know, second key point is, well, how like, should we do sustainability uh, to, we're seeing shifts to how we should, should we, do sustainability. And so the idea is, um, how do we approach sustainability in a, in a rigorous, uh, replicable manner, um, using data and trying to drive the, the greatest outcomes that one can. And then lastly, um, often we're faced with the challenges of not only embedding and designing with sustainability in mind, but also how do we then communicate those investments to key project stakeholders. Uh, we're seeing a shift in how folks are approaching that more so with the analytics and, and the data um, and computing that we have access to in this day and age towards which data-driven metrics to show my stakeholders. We, we work with a lot of folks in, in the areas I mentioned, including uh, folks in the investment community. And we're seeing more and more investor-driven interest in these impact-related metrics. Next slide, please. Um, something uh, important to mention, I'm gonna cover some, some shifts in, in the regulatory environment and how things are, are differing. I think one uh, key area is, is the, the ever-changing um, regulatory and, and, and policy world and recently some changes in federal building requirements and, and how those facilities get assessed. And so. Um, you know, something to note is a shift from, you know, previously life cycle cost analysis requirements uh, to what's now called life cycle cost effectiveness. And the idea here is that there are, are now requirements in these guiding principles for sustainable federal buildings where agencies should look um, within that life cycle perspective, ongoing upfront O&M. Um, so on and so forth, replacement value, but looking at how do additional benefits get driven around facilities and looking at some other considerations like carbon and the value of carbon, uh, like a broader set of benefits um, that I'll talk to in a second as well. Next slide, please. And so, um, you know, I think 
with that first shift, we're, we're also expecting additional um, actions as well. And I think generally from this current administration uh, and as a firm of economists that are following regulations and how uh, requirements and uh, analysis and reporting are being mandated, we're, we're certainly seeing a shift in, in broader considerations within a type of analysis um, called benefit cost analysis or cost benefit analysis. And this is the idea that for federal grant requirements, uh, so large merit-based grant programs, um, there are requirements to conduct economic business cases to speak to the public value of those projects in order to garner funding. Uh, we're seeing a shift towards a more inclusive set of characteristics. And you know, we um, mentioned here Executive Order 13990, the idea of implementing, incorporating uh, greenhouse gas um, values. I think we're also seeing a broader set of implications. If we look in the, the bottom right corner here, a set of um, now this is an example of an iceberg image where 90% of the icebergs uh, underwater. And so the, the shift here is from just the financial perspective, looking at upfront costs and O&M and broadening that towards social costs of carbon, uh, incorporating climate change scenarios, looking at changes in precipitation or temperature. How does that impact facilities? Uh, looking at broader air pollution considerations like NOx, SOX, VOCs, particular matter, what's the value of water, um, social equity and equitable outcome considerations and urban heat island effect. And so we're, we're seeing uh, a, a number of implications here around how federal guidance is, is changing as well. Uh, and I think, you know, one key area here as these programs, regulations keep driving greater investments in sustainability to meet ever-growing targets, um, that's especially uh, important now to have access to incentives and incentives related to, you know, what, what could be um, 300 plus billion dollars allocated to the uh, real estate sector from the latest infrastructure plan. Next slide, please. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, yeah, just to chime in there, Eric, nail on the head is, uh, folks, if you look at the bottom right-hand screen, those upfront costs or those O&M, that's just operations and maintenance, right? Real estate's incredibly expensive to maintain. Um, plus now, let's think about how competitive the landscape is with less and less tenants. COVID really shook things up in hospitality, office uh, spaces, especially retail too. So, you know, now more than ever, beyond just the regular maintenance costs, we're seeing owners and um portfolio managers really trying to compete in the landscape to attract tenants, right? Retain those tenants. But they're also having to address things like um, healthy indoor air quality, um, especially post-COVID, right? COVID prevention. Um, and so as Eric had mentioned, what the, the partnership and the synergy here is that folks don't realize they'll see the, the upcoming, uh, the upfront costs, right? The ongoing maintenance costs. And now they're, they're further uh, being stretched thin uh, monetarily with these COVID prevention, trying to attract a limited number of tenants and so on and so forth, right? And there are incentives that can help a lot of the property owners and tenants achieve these goals, right? Um, all while um, addressing really important factors, like I had mentioned uh, with, with COVID prevention. That, that one really comes to mind because as folks are coming back, back to the office, that has been a huge surge, at least that we've seen at the national level at Incentifind, is the amount of volume coming in specifically for mechanical system upgrades. So just wanted to make mention there. The other thing too, Eric, while we're on this slide, I was putting in some questions in the chat from our firms. And, um, you know, I think that you might have touched on it, but it might be great just to hear you um, repeat it again is, you know, I'm hearing that there's these new federal requirements. Are you guys finding at AutoCase that the U.S. at the federal level, I guess, is sort of settling on uh, a not perhaps not a singular uh, requirement, but you know, there's so many varying requirements. Are they sort of settling in, in one area that um, a lot of folks can? <laughs> I know it's a. It, it, by the way, that question came up from th the three different firms that emailed me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so, not. Not surprised at all. It, it is a great question. I've got some content, I think, that speaks to some varying regulations in, in different jurisdictions. Um, but the, the answer really is, is no at this point. There, there are um, lots of, of different options around disclosure and, 
um, and requirements that um, it seems like as interest grows and as uh, formality and structure is is taken with these international bodies and um, and different agencies that I'm confident we'll, we'll land on something soon enough. But right now, there's a bit of a hodgepodge uh, around that. Yeah, well, that pain point is definitely felt in the questions I received. <laughs> yeah, so while well, we can cover some of that that here, and so I think maybe just just shifting, that's a great segue to you know to what are we seeing in in the space, and so our our conversations with with investors and and um, investment organizations like Nasdaq where they're sort of playing middleman to issuers, um, to operators and, and to the investment community. I think, um, you know, we're, we're seeing from a disclosure standpoint, uh, definitely investor driven demand for um, more comprehensive reporting, more target oriented and quantitative outcomes. And I mentioned a few aspects here and you know, it's been, been quite a week or so within the corporate disclosure world. Um, but I'll just cover BlackRock. You know, I think uh, it's obviously the, the world's largest in investment firm. And um, Larry Fink's letter, annual letter CEOs is, is widely read. And, and this year really focused on climate disclosure um, with some specific um, disclosure suggestions from, um, from Mr. Fink on, you know, how business models need to be compatible with a net zero economy and specifically requesting companies to disclose how they're going to incorporate um, climate change and you know, different aspects of that and how material those changes might be to their business within their annual reporting. Um, and the idea here is that um, BlackRock will, will increasingly be disposed to vote against management and board directors if they're not making sufficient progress on sustainability related disclosures. And so the, the point below it, and of course we're seeing that from more and more investors globally, the large pension plans and endowments, foundations and, and other institutional investors. But you know, even uh, the last week we've got Royal Dutch Shell, ExxonMobil, Chevron facing major shareholder revolts against its um, climate reporting and, um, and speed of climate adaptation and some of those targets that, that they mentioned. So, you know, for instance, there, I think it's the, the first time that uh, a, a tiny minority owner um, was able to obtain two board seats through support of much larger institutional investors, uh, this small firm engine number one, uh, and, and were able to get two board seats um, because of their interest in, in more aggressive climate change, we've got you know other majors like DuPont suffering shareholder votes that are going against management too. So I think more and more investors are driving this and um, just only makes sense to follow where the, the capital is flowing. We've got uh, major international bodies, um, I think as well. So let's let's shift to goal setting where there's some some challenges. So back to consistency, You've got you know a number of of globally um, let's say um, followed um, goals UN PRIs the UN SDGs you know fairly widely uh, mentioned and and the, the folks that we work with um, you know large portfolio holders and publicly traded REITs um, you also have from a investor interest and in, and in peer benchmarking perspective the the GRES benchmarking system um, more and more used in uh, helping to identify standing and, and how to improve that standing. And then um, just generally, as uh, folks think about certifications and, uh, and other targets to achieve, you know, there, there's more complications here as well, and maybe some misalignment uh, with, with some of the disclosures and um, and materiality considerations where you've got LEED, Golden Globes, uh, Green Globes, Energy Star, BOMA, Living Building Challenge, Bream, Well, Fit Well, um, different drivers to achieve different levels of achievement within these makes it a little bit challenging to compare these systems on an apples to apples basis or approach them in a consistent manner. Let me go to next slide, please. And I, and I think as, as we take that and kind of broaden the perspective of now focusing on reporting, so taking kind of the materiality concept and uh, using that in, in, well, how do we take our investments in sustainability? How do we take, um, you know, all of these actions that we're doing and now report on them? And, and again, there's no formal global standard. You've got um, 
Global Reporting Initiative and, and SASB and ISO, uh, International Standards Organization, sort of taking up a lot of the, the global space in, in creating consistency in ESG reporting. And we're seeing, I think, this, this last one, a whole lot of momentum around this uh, TCFD Task Force for Climate related financial disclosures. And really it's the idea to develop voluntary and consistent climate related financial risk disclosures to, to companies, including in, in the real estate space. So it's it's a bit convoluted, but there is shifting momentum. You know, SASB is aligning with another international organization for another set of reporting standards. So they're, they're amalgamating and trying to create some consistency. Um, Shifting here to regulatory disclosure. So, um, you know, I think something as, as well here, this is regulations often drive action. Uh, we've got some global international financial reporting standards. So this global financial standard committee is looking to create uh, some upcoming guidance in, in COP26. We've got um, SFDR, this European um, program that that's sort of uh, taking aim to account for sustainability ESG factors for financial market participants. Uh, and then finally, this uh, recent one, just uh, about a month old, uh, Biden executive order on the um, disclosure of financial risk for climate change. And this really uh, aims to help the federal government to address, as they call it, the, the climate crisis and mitigate uh, economic risks of climate change, um, starting with measurement and reporting. Uh, lastly, just talk about some of the, the, the differences in policies. So we work across North America. Our software is focused in Canada and the U.S. and 5,000 municipalities. So we, we um, like to keep abreast as to, to what's happening. And we're seeing, I think, very much um, related to the last administration and the decentralization of, of policy uh, related to sustainability, a lot more state and local governments driving outcomes. And so we've got California commercial net zero energy targets by 2030. You've got Maine um, starting its um, electric heat pump and, and requiring much higher proportion of, of buildings using those. Washington State being the first to enact commercial energy standards. Uh, Miami-Dade BE305. So we're seeing a lot of movement towards performance standards and compliance measures in, in different government levels. Uh, we helped Miami-Dade with this particular analysis depicting the economic value of, of um, enacting benchmarking on and retuning for large um, 50,000 square foot plus commercial facilities. And then I think just to note um, a, a fairly aggressive and important ones, New York Local Law 97, um, um, which requires different tiers of um, carbon targets over time with substantial penalties, something like $268 per ton of not exceeding them. So just to just lay in the, the landscape of what's happening out there, lots of, lots of action, as you can see, lots of different action in different areas. Maybe we'll go to the next slide, please. Yeah, and I was just gonna say, before we do that on the building mm -hmm. policies too, um, we always tell folks, yes, the policies, the mandates are are increasing as far as uh, energy efficiency requirements, water conservation, renewables like Title 24 in California, Massachusetts, trying to pass that too. Um, but anytime there is a mandate, uh, we like to tell our, our owners, our end users, there's, um, don't let that scare you. Um, there's almost always going to be incentives associated with a lot of these mandates because it, at the greater, you know, kind of level, government doesn't want to stand in the way of economic development. So, you know, if you hear that word building, new building policy or more stringent building policies, uh, additional mandates being passed um, for these performance standards, there's going to be a coupling of incentives. And of course, um, incentivize housing, all of those at the, you know, each individual uh, level, right? So again, just, we like to tell folks not to be scared of it. <laughs> There's usually going to be money on the table as well. Yeah. And that's a, a great way, obviously, to spur actions, to provide incentives and uh, reduce the, the cost to meet these targets. And, and we're seeing lots of different programs and, and ways in which to to help drive that change. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll just shift here. So we, we talked about some of the themes and, and what's happening in the reporting regulatory disclosure standpoint. We're just gonna sort of shift to 
to um, this ESG concept and really um, what it is and, and how we define it and how we define it given the um, role that we play in the, in the buildings and infrastructure ecosystem. And I think there's lots of different terminology, nomenclature in the space and sustainability and resilience. And um, we've used a variety of, of different acronyms over time. Um, you know, in, in the world of, of ESG, I think the, the goal first and foremost is to, to drive change in a beneficial manner, to create efficiencies, to create benefits, to reduce externalities uh, or broader detriment to the environment and society. And um, using the concept and creating formal regulations, frameworks, reporting standards to help drive at the end of the day action. And really, as, as we see it from an economics point of view, that there are tools and techniques and methods to quantify ESG implications to projects. And it's that old adage of you can't measure something, you can't manage it. And we're firm believers in that as well. And so the idea is to use quantitative data-driven insights to help drive greater ESG value, greater ESG investments in the name of financial, social, and environmental outcomes. And so uh, the, the way that, that we frame things is um, financial implications are always going to be, um, you know, of the utmost important in projects. So understanding that full life cycle perspective. So not just the upfront cost, but how to greater investments in efficiencies um, drive long-term trade-offs, operations and maintenance, replacement, residual value incentives, how does that all fit and what's the financial snapshot? But, but adding to that, some of the key outcomes that relate to, to these investments. So if you invest in indoor environmental quality, uh, enhanced daylighting, uh, enhanced ventilation flows, higher filtration rates, a thermal comfort, you're driving value for occupants of, of the facility, health, productivity, absenteeism reductions, uh, rec recreation amenity value, all these considerations that are really important, especially now, as Natalie mentioned, with this um, shift in, in what's happening in, in terms of building usage with COVID. Uh, and then environmental implications. So we've um, all recognized the importance of decarbonization and all the policies and, and shifts that I mentioned, um, speaking to those quantifying carbon reductions from projects across the life of it but speaking to other environmental factors, um, water use, water quality, broader set of air pollutants, that's really what we're focusing on in this space. Next slide. So uh, how do we do it? Well, we've integrated with a, a number of partners. The idea is that we're uh, trying to create an application that uh, really fits into a workflow. And so we're tying in with these sort of ubiquitous tools in the market. So for embodied carbon identification and materials, uh, tying in with Tally and one-click LCA for time of use for energy storage, um, tying into to watt time for cost estimation, uh, tying in with RS means uh, for energy simulation and, and goal setting, Cove tool and architecture 2030, and of course to help determine what incentives are related to projects and specific investments in specific jurisdictions, incentivizing to help drive uh, outcomes within that. Next slide. Uh, you can click it one more time. <laughs> and one more time. It's animated, got it. And one more time. Thank you. Uh, so the idea here is, is the workflow of AutoCase. So the idea is that we've got 5,000 municipalities across North America. We're tied into weather stations. We're tied into local wage rates, property values, information on the uh, makeup of the grid and the emissions factors from that, scarcity of water, availability of public rec and green space, you know, all of these factors that allow you to make a highly location specific business case and determine specific outcomes from that. And so the idea is that you can uh, slowly iterate from a conceptual design to your, your final design, integrate that with the tools that I mentioned within the broader workflow of the design team, collaborate with uh, team members, uh, better understand outcomes and trade-offs, and then support the uh, stakeholder engagement side with 
ready to make uh, ready made reports and, and other analytics to speak to the to the value of your project and what value you created with a certain set of investments and characteristics. So that's the idea with with the software that whole sort of workflow from early stage design to reporting. ESG implications and, and stakeholder engagement, earning lead points, so on and so forth. Maybe next slide. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and where incentives are going to fit in, because we always get asked this, right? So how it marries with auto case, it's going to be in that planning and design phase, right? That's where incentivizing can reveal all available incentives, whether it's based just on location. Are you going to use one plot of land over another? Are you going to use an existing asset and retrofit the interior or do something ground up? So incentives can tell the entire story of how, you know, what goals are set, what can be rewarded. And then as you go through the design process with your architect and engineer, or other consultants, you're still using Incentifine's uh, data to refine, okay, here's what was possible during the planning stage. Now, during the design phase, you're getting warmer on what the owner or the end user is going to really receive from an incentive standpoint, right? And as you go through the reporting and into the construction phase, that's when you'll, you'll, the project will actually receive the incentives. So we actually, our incentives uh, fit right into this process, right? And as you go down this line, that's, a, that's how the incentives will be um, actually realized in the form of either a cash reimbursement, which always gets everybody exciting at the close of construction, right? Or perhaps it's a, a tax incentive. So just wanted to layer that in. Yeah, that's a great point. And we, we can talk about that too, how it, how it fits in here. So I think the, the work that we do does support different stages of, of projects and how those projects iterate. So um, you know, from early stage planning, we've, we've invested a lot of time and effort uh, within the application to build default data. So identifying for a specific location, for a specific typology on a per square foot basis, um, given a certain number of employees, what are those operational characteristics that, that are expected on energy, on water, on occupant counts, on wage rates, sort of uh, the, the, the information that uh, can save a substantial amount of time with our users that depicts sort of the, the base level characteristics to then you compare your enhanced building, whatever um, in improved design elements from energy efficiency to water to the uh, IEQ aspects. And so the idea there is that you, you have some trade-offs that you might be evaluating. What's the impact of going to net zero or electrification, um, which is better um, in uh, New York, there are, um, regulations around uh, requiring either solar PVs or green roofs on, on buildings. So, you know, which one drives the greatest value? You've got modules for that. Uh, comparing and prioritizing. So looking at, say, different um, energy use intensity or carbon targets and trading off different designs to help meet those, to help optimize what you're doing how do incentives fit in there? And maybe Natalie, I'll get you to cover again some how, how you might fit in and then finally benchmarking and communicating. So once you've established and iterated your design, um, how do you speak to your shareholders? How do you speak to your stakeholders? How do you communicate within your client or project teams towards the merit, the value, the trade-offs of cost and outcomes that, that you've created? How do you meet benchmarking or, or ESG mandates within that as well. Yeah. Um, and for the early stage planning, if you were to ask Incentify what majority of our end users, again, they're developers, property owners, major tenants uh, with large portfolios across the country. If you ask, you know, where do they see the greatest benefit for auto case and incentives? It's going to be in the early stage because they're having to determine how are we going to address that new corporate sustainability goal, right? That reduces our energy consumption by 30%, right? Or how are we going to address this um, green measure that I, you know, I can't get around because it's a mandate by the state or the, the local municipality or other local governments, right? And so where we hear a lot of questions about 
you know, bringing folks to auto case is, well, which is going to be the better option incentivifying? I, I see, you know, where, where, can you do a cost benefit analysis? No, incentivifying doesn't do that. We are only a database for incentives. The auto case is, is the folks that you would want to turn to, to do that analysis during that early stage planning. You know, how are you going to address everything from the mandates to other types of, uh, you know, goals? And then, you know, we layer in the incentives that are available, again, in that early stage planning, but it's going to be auto case that goes over which is going to be the best scenario with the greatest impact, right? We'll just have incentives to reward you once you make that decision. And, and once you've determined what you're going to do on your individual facility, um, there's an opportunity with the analytics to take those projects within a project dashboard and we'll, we'll quickly run through a, a demo, as Natalie mentioned earlier, um, then to scale it to the portfolio level, to the fund level, to identify what are these aggregate benefits? What are the um, total carbon uh, equivalent um, reductions that we've driven because of our investments? What are some of these broad-based occupant benefits? What are the community uh, social environmental outcomes that um, we'd like to highlight and speak to and track and measure to help with those reporting implications that I, I covered a little bit earlier. And so the idea is to, uh, to better speak, communicate and understand um, a macro perspective as to the value within not just single buildings or single design elements, but from a portfolio perspective as well. So maybe we can shift uh, some of that overview and, and, uh, concept considerations to some case studies. And, um, you know, Natalie um, forced me to cut down some of my case studies. And I can't, I can't resist because we've got so many really neat projects that, that we're involved in. But I'm, I'm going to highlight um, a great collaboration with uh, one of the world's largest asset management companies and um, real estate holders in, in Brookfield Properties. Um, and so we engaged in a, a series of pilot projects with Brookfield and uh, we've worked with a few groups um, within them and um, we do work with uh, developers and, and owners and publicly traded um, REITs, um, private equity investors, plus the um, public clients and, and architects and consultants that I mentioned as well. But um, this one is interesting because it's sort of looking at as designed buildings um, across a set of developments. So we've got um, this one large mixed use development called Pier 70, where there's um, substantial investments in sustainability um, in California, looking at um, horizontal or site related amenities within this large mixed use development. Uh, looking at individual facilities, parcel A and parcel D, um, where you're looking at what are the implications to go into higher levels of sustainability and what are the costs and benefits of trading up in this particular case going to lead platinum as compared to lead gold and what is the value therein? And then looking at uh, a few others in some different locations, but I'm going to focus on the, the Pier 70 project. And so maybe we can go to the next slide. So there's, there's really two components. There's all of the, the site amenities we're calling horizontal infrastructure. And then we've got the building vertical uh, infrastructure. So the, uh, the horizontal elements really, like an amenity laden site. So looking at uh, complete streets, um, a market square, um, and a whole lot of green stormwater infrastructure and, and public viewing and, and recreation amenities, um, different surface coverage types um, that help with infiltration of stormwater, that help with water quality runoff, that create habitat and carbon sequestration implications uh, that create a, a much more um, a greater sense of, of community within this. And so um, the idea was to, to better understand how those characteristics plus um, a waterfront promenade and a waterfront terrace all combined it to drive some, some outcomes and, and what are those outcomes. And so we've got that on the next slide, uh, looking at some of the, the implications. So really what we do when we create a business case in the software, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Um, one more, thank you, uh, is we're comparing something against something else. So in this case, just looking at how does this um, 
green amenity related site provide value over a long term study period. So looking at, I believe in this case, um, 40 year um, analysis, looking at the costs upfront on an annual basis, and looking at the benefits on an annual basis once operational, how do these drive value and what is that value? And so taking um, science and taking empirical economic data, peer reviewed literature, um, we're quantifying different design elements. So how does a, uh, an extra tree or this type of vegetation or this type of uh, paver, how does that drive value and sequester carbon? How much? How does that reduce um, urban heat island, drive evapotranspiration and reduce temperature uh, in that area? Uh, how does um, rainwater, water quality runoff and pollute loadings get reduced because of these investments? So we're taking the science algorithms, let's call it, uh, and we're taking those outcomes from those design elements, looking at climate change, how do these change over time, and then valuing them with economics. And so this is the, the business case and we see here, um, you know, this total, if we look at the three phases, about 60 million, one, six million in additional upfront costs um, are driving um, a set of, you know, broad-based comprehensive benefits. So this is, this one's a little bit less about what is our financial return and it's more about what are the community values created from flood risk, re mitigation, property value uplift, recreation amenities, um, urban heat island, mitigation, water quality improvements, uh, education opportunities for um, vegetation, green stormwater infrastructure, and public health improvements from additional recreation opportunities, uh, as well as the air pollution reduction. So we're quantifying, valuing these, and putting Brookfield in a position to understand the value that they're creating and spending this additional 16 million, but also allowing them to communicate those benefits to prospective um, occupants of, of the development and, and other, um, let's say, municipal stakeholders as well. Yeah. And real quick, Eric, just to kind of pause there is that um, while we weren't, Incentify was not on this, this pilot, I can tell you the flood risk, the uh, recreational aspect, um, any of those, um, or even uh, is the environmental, uh, sorry, the urban heat island, would that have been a green roof by chance? Just curious. Uh, that was the, the vegetation around the set. Oh, okay, okay. So no, uh, just asking because what we're seeing um, at Incentifying is these community benefits uh, for the property owners or developers uh, can, will, should be communicated to the municipality because that's where those property tax incentives come from. Uh, we house a lot of those. We're seeing cities pilot more of those, especially as it becomes uh, related to things like flood mitigation in you know, cities that are more prone to flooding um, you know, or fireproofing in cities where that that, or I should say states uh, where that's a little bit more rampant. So, you know, your tool here, Eric, would be a great way for those developers to clearly communicate to those municipalities. Here's the community benefit that we are bringing it throughout our development or across our phases, right? Uh, or in the folks that we're attracting to further develop, um, you know, our parcels of land. And, you know, they could see that realized um, from the municipality uh, by way of a property tax incentive essentially. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that probably speaks to the, the facility example on the next slide that um, is part of the same development. So looking now, taking that, that site set of amenities and, and now looking at, well, what if we develop this mixed use facility and we take what's been currently designed, this lead gold, you know, very high standard, but then looking at, hey, what if we invest to take it to a higher degree of sustainability? to lead platinum and invest more in energy efficiencies and water conservation, um, improve ventilation rates, increase uh, daylighting options, go through a more enhanced commissioning, uh, and then invest in RECs, renewable energy credits and carbon offsets. And um, in this particular case, taking that snapshot of incremental value over that long-term period. And again, in the same way, looking at, well, how do those investments drive efficiencies? Uh, how do, what is the um, utility cost 
save kilowatt hours or MMBTUs and that gas of um, water? And what are the value of uh, additional ventilation rates and productivity and health improvements and absenteeism, uh, looking at occupant value and the value to the community. And in this particular case, driving substantial value through fairly minor investments, but looking at substantial benefits primarily to the occupants within this enhanced design. Um, and we're seeing a lot of interest in ventilation and indoor environmental quality, obviously, with COVID, but um, here's an example of, of using that peer reviewed literature to better understand outcomes and the drivers of outcomes to speak to the value. Yeah. Um, Eric, I know we've got nine minutes here, so I wanna give, um, there's one of two things we can do. I don't know how long your, your demo is, but we can always record that and put that on our YouTube channel. But I want to make sure um, some of the questions that I've been posting, because they come to me either DM or, um, you know, like I said, our firms, three of our firms emailed in advance. I want to make sure we get those answered if you think that would be great. Um, or what are you kind of saying here just with the nine minutes that's left? Yeah, sure thing. So I can, I can, you know, without getting to all the details, just give a quick look uh, to the software. And I think the idea here is not to fully inform everyone as to all the nuances of the software, but just generally show you that, yes, we, we have it. And here's how we can embed incentives uh, and then uh, quickly cover the questions. Does, does that make sense? I think I can, can fit it all in. I'm going to stop sharing and let you take the wheel. And then if we've got time, I want to make sure we look at these questions. Is it really good? <laughs> yeah, lots, lots of great questions I saw. So can, can you see my screen? Absolutely. All right, great. So uh, this is just an example. So this is what we call the project workspace, the first screen that you uh, can see when, you're, when you've created a project in AutoK. So it's cloud-based um, just through your browser. And the idea here is that you've got a, a building, um, you've got uh, a project, and you're uh, creating a project. So you're selecting the location, in this case, Denver, to drive all of those underlying characteristics I mentioned related to, in this case, Denver. Uh, select the type, the name of the project, the, the type. Is it a, a retrofit? Is it a new building? How large is it? What's the site area? Uh, how many occupants? And what typology? So we've got about three, three dozen typologies to choose from, and there's different underlying information that will default. You choose the duration of the analysis, and basically you're, you're off to the races. And so in this per particular case, we've got a set of investments and, and improvements. So enhancements to ventilation, um, gains to energy efficiency, um, a solar PV investment, uh, and an HVAC investment. And we're creating sort of the typical building, and we've got this enhanced building with those additional values. And so we're sort of going into the HVAC, we're adjusting the flow rate. Uh, that's all we're doing. We're going to life cycle costs and we're implanting, well, how much does this solar PV system cost? We do have default values around that. We've got ranges of cost estimates and you're putting in operations and maintenance, other details, identifying what the um, energy generation is, how much you're saving in this particular case, 15%. And then um, within the LCCA, here's where we have the incentive button that can identify what those incentives are. And we can click this and it will take you to uh, Incentify, where then you insert your info and um, you go through the very easy process that um, Natalie can, can depict. But I think in this particular case, once you have those incentives, in this particular case, uh, $100,000 for this enhanced HVAC system, you just insert them into the project and you click compare designs. AutoCase links up to the cloud, grabs all that site-specific information. Now you're able to, to compare your project and create a set of analytics as to those outcomes, financial, uh, social, environmental outcomes and slice and dice the results how, however you like. Um, and so I think that that's the idea. Um, just to give you a flavor as to, to what's in the software and how um, incentifying connects and can collaborate with your business case. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, 
Eric, that's uh, awesome. And actually, I might keep you a few minutes after it's over just so we can get a full recording of that to put on the YouTube channel, you know, for folks. But if you don't mind, I'd love to go into just some rapid fire here. I'll tell you <laughs> the question yeah, is coming from. And, you know, I know a lot of this you have covered, but it would just be great to kind of hear it all uh, again, right? So let me come out of um, this, go to the chat real quick. So a lot of our A&E firms, um, you know, for ESG, I think they mean it in ESG goal setting, right? We've got to think about the hat and architect and engineer wears. And they're wondering, you know, are you guys really seeing um, ESGs being driven at the portfolio level or are you seeing it more at the project level, um, you know, or is it kind of chicken in, in the egg, right? It's, it's both driving one or the other. Um, but I think a lot of this question came from this architecture firm seeing that, you know, net zero by 2050 coming into one of their major, um, you know, clients that they serve. And, you know, the, it, it obviously changed all of the, the new design standards. So what are you kind of seeing on that front? Yeah, that and we're seeing a lot of that on, on our end, too. So with, within specific projects, so there are um, projects that need to be um, developed because of needs of you know, certain clients. And so the, the work that we might do might help reaching higher level targets. So um, maybe there's um, net zero energy or net zero carbon by certain dates. And that means um, maybe those dates are becoming more aggressive. Maybe those targets are more aggressive than considered. Maybe clients are, are seeking uh, more aggressive outcomes just because that's where they feel like um, regulations and policies are moving to and they want to get ahead of it. So, um, you know, specifically within projects, we're helping to determine, you know, what, what are the implications? What are the outcomes from different um, goal setting targets. So what if we go to, you know, net zero by this date with these investments? Uh, what if we use these sets of materials? What if we use, you know, these other design elements and characteristics? And often there's an opportunity to, to decarbonize, um, but also drive other areas of value. And I think that's, that's a key area that, that we're focusing on. So I think from a, a project design standpoint, often that's where we're involved very much like uh, incentifying is in helping to denote how to meet more stringent targets with more um, 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 sophisticated or aggressive investments in, in energy use intensity. What are the different options that are technically feasible, but which of those options drive the greatest bang for the buck? And then kind of ruling up all those elements within a project once you, you've designed them or have different scenarios and you can set your architecture 2030 goals. And then I, I um, would imagine then from an individual project basis, the opportunity is then to aggregate those projects within the platform to speak to what those net implications are more at a you know, multi-property or, or portfolio level to then meet those overarching obligations. Right. Absolutely. So your software essentially could start at the project level and contribute to a larger portfolio. So this, um, this comes actually from one of our smaller developers. Um, they operate in about three states, right? So they, it, for them, you know, what if there wasn't a much larger portfolio? Is there reporting type that they should be considering uh, as far as addressing ESG, whether it's being driven by requirements or, you know, maybe they're trying to shape their stakeholders' uh, view of their developments. What, what should a small development group, like what's their approach? Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I think there are folks that, um, that can probably answer that better than I, you know, the sustainability consultants of, of the world and um, other folks that look at these different activities from, from GRES um, to using lead or well or fit well. And I think there's different strategies and suggestions. I think there's a variety of, of reporting elements that the market and investors to communities are, are looking for. So I think probably for now, a mix is, is the best approach. And we're finding clients that we're working with on, on ESG reporting are, are following multiple areas. They're following uh, GRI, they're following the UN SDGs. They're trying to position themselves well within GRES. They're going after uh, certain lead standards or other um, standards. They're, they're, they're taking a mixed approach because 
you know, I think it's clear with all of this that there's lots of different things to do and that's the challenge. And so we're seeing a bit of a diversification, if you will, in, in these elements. Yeah, no, absolutely. And there's all sorts of uh, reporting types out there. Hence, folks, why we partner with auto cases, because there, there are so many different ways to kind of skin this cat. Um, they're here to help you navigate that. Now, I know we're at time, um, so I want to be sure I kind of finish with this note. Eric, if you'll hang tight, I'm going to finish asking you all the questions so we can at least get it into the recording. Uh, folks, you're going to find the recording on our YouTube channel. The link will be blasted to any attendees as well as those who uh, signed up but couldn't attend today just because of conflict. So, um, you know, Eric, I'm going to finish asking you some questions. And then if you could, um, let's finish that demo. And then folks, if you want to go to the YouTube channel, we, as you know, we cut all of our videos to where, you know, if you want to go directly into this Q&A session, you can fast forward right to that, right? If you want to see the demo and how Incentifine is integrated into the software, you can see that as well. So Eric, if that's okay with you, I'd love to keep you for a few more minutes. Yeah, let's do it. Thanks everyone. Appreciate the time. Absolutely. And we put Eric's uh, email address to the person who asked for it. We put it in the chat um, and you guys can also um, get connected to AutoCase um, through Incentifind and our dashboard. I'll demo that here in a second. So Eric, let me go back to the questions here. I thought this one <laughs> was really good and maybe that's too much to boil, you know, the ocean on this one, but um, how are state and city level governments influencing these ESG requirements? Like should, should our developers anticipate, our, our developers and property owners, should they anticipate being mandated for certain ESG type reporting because of building policies? Or as we saw in the case, you know, if you want to, if a developer or property owner wants to communicate to the municipality that um, they have met these community benefits, that that municipality such as LA or Miami or Boston might say, you know what, we use XYZ type reporting and you know, that's how they should anticipate to communicate that. Can you tell us a little bit about, about how state and local governments could influence this? Sure. Well, I, I think there's, you know, it's always a dynamic situation uh, on that side of things. And, you know, often we're, we're supporting governments. So outside of the software, we've got a uh, quite a vigorous advisory practice, and we'll work with with governments of different levels to understand implications to different policy mechanisms. So, um, you know, we just supported, as an example, the city of San Antonio with their climate um, action and adaptation program, and looking at a few different mechanisms uh, within that to to better understand what the implications are and help them achieve those, you know, fairly stringent. Um, climate targets and, and decarbonization targets that, that they've identified. And so, you know, within that, looking at, um, you know, a, a set of characteristics from um, white roofs to um, electric vehicle charger readiness to PV roof readiness to net zero energy, municipal buildings, uh, urban agriculture program and energy benchmarking for commercial and multifam. And so I think, you know, governments are, are actively uh, all over the place at, at all levels, looking at, well, how do we help drive outcomes that are in our best interests or drive outcomes that help meet, you know, impending um, um, re regulatory regimes as well. And so you know, I think um, there's, there's lots happening all the time. It's quite dynamic. And I think it's, it's yes, on the decarbonization side, but it's also a, a little bit broader as well, like, uh, for instance, as we think of affordability and equitable outcomes, uh, you've got California that's designing climate smart building challenge uh, or uh, climate smart building standards in a way that that helps to uphold equity and includes anti displacement policies. That's uh, the Healthy Homes Act, AB 1232. Um, and so there's, I think, broader set of considerations, um, electrification, decarbonization, that's really top of mind right now, but we're seeing more and more around uh, health, welfare, and equity, uh, and the protection of environment and, and habitat 
all kind of you know playing a role in in this ESG world. So there's it's just such a dynamic market. There's lots that's going to change, and I think it's ever changing, and, and one should expect that. Yeah, no, you're 100 percent right. And what's crazy is as you were um, saying where the ESG reporting's kind of headed. Um, that's eerily uh, reflective of a lot of the incentives that we're seeing growing. Uh, one incentive category we're seeing growing massively at the national level, especially, you know, if you look at the Western part of the U.S., uh, where I think they're still experiencing one of the worst droughts to date, um, water conservation. That is a huge growing category. When addressing water conservation at the building level, whether indoor, outdoor, um, it's it's uh, there's a lot of incentives that we're seeing pumped in at mostly I'd say state local levels, uh, water utilities especially. But then you look at kind of eastern United States um, that are affected by things like hurricane, flash flooding. We're seeing um, fantastic resilience incentives. If you're addressing, if your building or plot of land is going to be addressing any sort of flood mitigation, right? Uh, even a green roof um, can get a decent property tax abatement. So it's interesting how ESG reporting requirements um, sort of echo the incentive landscape. So let me um, keep asking a question here. Uh, this came from an architect and I put up this um, little uh, graphic because um, I think it might marry well with it. But this is from one of our architects and they've asked me this, I don't know how many times, I'm sure they've asked Grace this as well. Uh, it says, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm in the, my goal setting um, session uh, with my client, right? We're establishing the goals, the design goals for this particular development. And, you know, how, if at all, am I supposed to help them navigate this ESG space? I mean, you know, it's, it's part of that conversation, but I think it's a great question. It's at what point is it, do you just know as an architect, look, based on this pro project's location or based on its design requirements, this is really a point where I need to engage somebody like Auto Case because I'm bringing this type of expertise to the, to the mix and they're going to bring, you know, the, the rest of it. Does that, does that question sort of make sense? Yeah, I think that's why we're, we're seeing such, um, you know, interdisciplinary teams on on every project because they are so complex and um, you've got the regulatory and public policy side you've got the incentive side you've got the ea environmental assessment side and you know especially as we're seeing areas with chronic flooding or drought or other implications and so i think um you know how we frame ourselves as that we're a, a, another tool in your toolbox to to better understand implications in, in our particular space um, really the, the only one providing this comprehensive business case to be able to look at how to meet these objectives in, in um, multi-dimensional ways. It's not just about decarbonization. It's about some of these other implications there's, and there's other impacts related to certain investment types that, that might have one driver, but where there's co-benefits that are also a possibility. And so I think speaking to that comprehensive value perspective and playing a role with other professionals in a project and how that gets designed and developed is, is really what, um, you know, what we recommend. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's uh, the marrying of the only holistic database to examine buildings, how they're designed and built, right, holistically. And then you have, you know, a software, like you said, you guys are more comprehensive. Plus, the, the, on the demo, which I'll have you do here in a second, um, just that easy way of comparison. Here was the base building design, right, or the baseline. Here's what it, you know, uh, the comparison when we stretch our goals to something quite achievable, right? We didn't, we didn't go for the pie in the sky, but we, we know that we're going to obtain our goals um, with the right amount of impact that we want to see. So that said, um, maybe this is where I can hand it back to you. But this question, we do get a lot of incentivizing. Folks are coming to us, especially where there's mandates, whether it's solar mandates, uh, you know, a building energy performance mandates. These are statewide, sometimes sweeping mandates, right? They'll come to incentivize and say, oh, we're going to have to to put solar um, on our property. You know, can, can you guys just do the cost benefit analysis just on solar? 
Again, Incentivine doesn't do that. Um, so can you talk about how our partnership with, you know, AutoCase, how you guys, you know, can you address a single measure at once or does it have to always be, or do you recommend this sort of holistic approach? And if you need a demo, feel free to take the screen. Yeah, sure, sure thing. That's a, a great question. So I think it, it, you know, that concept of the ground up and iterative through the process from uh, individual design elements to a portfolio, that's really the, the goal with the application. So looking at um, different PV systems, looking at different HVAC systems, uh, different water conservation measures, different ways to drive uh, value to occupants from thermal comfort controls or daylighting or better quality views, whatever it may be. Um, really the opportunity within the software is to take those individual elements. And in many cases, that's where our users or architects, building owners, other consultants are using the software for those individual design components. So which of those um, yields the greatest value, drives the greatest outcome, um, all towards this broader view of, of achieving you know, a certain target, a certain outcome, a certain level of um, branded sustainability within any number of those systems that I mentioned. So I think you know, a key point is that it can be used for that. It can be used to then depict with all of those components added up, what's that value proposition? What's the outcome, uh, the implication on a, on a whole building perspective? And then how can we roll that up more broadly, including the site, but as well as from a portfolio perspective. And something that I am remiss that I didn't mention is that um, you know, the sort of latest and greatest news with auto cases are uh, collaboration um, and integration with ARC and the ARC scoring platform from USGBC and, and taking the data that underlies ARC on existing uh, facilities within a portfolio, being able to, to look at how certain investments or the performance of the, the building compares to a baseline building, and then being able to build that business case um, from energy, water, and, and broader considerations. So that's something really exciting that, um, that we've just released and um, are looking to, um, you know, kind of share that story towards. So I think it covers all those bases from new construction to retrofits and renovations. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that kind of comes to the last uh, two questions in, in the list is that, you know, the main issue is being able to communicate, you know, that actual value of what you're driving outside your, your project. In other words, who's your target audience, right, uh, for these reports, for that, that communication. And we've seen, at least from Incentify, and I'd love to hear your, your point of view, what we get asked is, uh, okay, great. So, you know, we're going to drive, we being the developer will say, we're going to drive these, the implementation of these green measures, right? Because now we see there is incentives that are going to help us actually implement this, this equipment. And, um, you know, uh, oh, I see. Are you speaking from your current screen? No, no, we're just, we're just chatting out loud. Um, but, you know, the developers will say, uh, okay, we can now do this thanks to the incentives. We have the monies to implement these uh, green measures, right? Uh, what kind of uh, publicity will that can, you know, have you seen out there in Sinify that can help us tell this story, right? Because maybe it's, it's going to attract that anchor tenant who has similar values, right? Maybe it's going to be something to communicate because it's go it'll echo that this is a healthier building, right? Or a better community that's being uh, developed. So I know on our end, we, we always joke it's it's kind of the the publicity behind the reporting and the marketing of it right but what i mean what, what are you guys saying as far as reporting on your end yeah i exactly to, sorry just uh pulled out my earbud exactly to to the point i think there's there's multiple um stakeholders involved in projects so it, it could be just folks within the project team that are looking to to better understand outcomes from from a reporting standpoint it could be uh, building owners that architects are relating to, to to share with them the value that they've created within specific design elements or with with their whole project uh, assessment it could be um, a developer looking to engage 
a community, a, a, a local government with the merits of their project. And, you know, here's the value that we're, we're adding because we're investing more in more sustainable, more resilient, healthier building versus how minimum building code would dictate or, or versus a, another competitor. Here's the, the extra value and that can support engagement and conversations with an entitlement or whatever else. So I think, you know, there, it's, it's those elements it's, you know, different project participants. It's increasingly with investors and speaking to the impacts and um, ESG outcomes. So it's, I think, multidimensional. It's a, very much like there's um, a, a variety of use cases and stages of use. There's also a variety of stakeholders that might digest and, and leverage this information to uh, make decisions.